right here, right now, the right we. The right you, the right other, the right me. The answer to every question, the road sign to where we might be. It will feel good when we look back. What a beautiful thing hindsight be. Scarred face, scared body, shirt dripping, blood and sweat drenched. Unfaced spirit, untainted faith, fierce traced high, still tight cleansed. Let every drop of my spiritual blood bleed deep into the soil so it may hit the ground hard and fertilize my place of toil. Let confidence and humility coexist. Passion never at the expense of meekness. Even my enemies will line up in single file to bear weak witness. And when I cry, I pray no man mistake my tears for weakness, for I lick them off my face to taste the bitter taste of sweetness. And with that, may the fire that incinerates our frailties remain lit. Against the devil and man, every day we take it. It's never implied, but it's exposed, never explained, but it's explicit. That the biggest attack is against ourselves. That's the reason why we can't quit. For if we give up on ourselves, who then is the victory? If not I, then me. If not us, then we. Who's the other? That's the mystery. Indeed, it's enigmatic that my biggest enemy is my inner me. That's why I speak of myself as if of another. It's not my story, but his. And that is how I made history. Thank you. So I figured we could, um, you know, I could uh, introduce myself to you all uh, that way. My name is Shingi Mavima. Um, I'm an author, uh, originally from Zimbabwe. Uh, by way of uh, Michigan, USA. Uh, just arrived uh, for a month long visit to Canberra, uh, loving your city. Uh, but I do, you know, I want to thank the folks at, at, at Smith's for allowing me this hour, 5.30 to 6.30, to sort of introduce my book, Pashena. Uh, copies over there. And if you like what you hear, they're going for $20 a piece. But whether you like him, whether you like what you hear or not, uh, my mom here also made cupcakes. <laughs> now those are complimentary, and they are over there. So please grab them. We don't want to have to take them back. I'm watching my weight, but they'll be gone by the end of the night if I have my way with them. Um, so the book we are talk, we are introducing is Pashena, uh, and I'm going to read three or four passages from it. Uh, open it up to you all for conversation. If you guys have any questions about uh, about the about the book, about the story, about the process, this is the time where we are having that conversation. So, is that all right, Michelle? All right, perfect. Um, so because when I've done this in the past, I've been around audiences that have either seen the flyer or these things, so they kind of know the book. Follow me on social media and all these things. Uh, but I figure I'm in in, uh, in, uh, in strange lands today, so I guess the first thing I've got to do is sort of read, introduce what the book is about, yeah? In general. Oh, we have it right here on the back. Um, Pashena, literally the dirt field, is the coming of age tale of a group of neighborhood friends growing up in the low-income township of Gangamvura, Mutare, which is in Zimbabwe. The story spans five years in the mid to late 90s, a period during which most of the boys go from seven to eight to the precipice of their teen years. Shingi, that's me, uh, has recently started school and is getting to meet the array of characters that are his neighborhood peers. Among them are Tao, he is stuttering, reserved, and loyal next to a neighbor. Strive and Wellington, hilarious and crass, orphans from across the street who had grown up in the rural areas and were now being raised by their teenage sister, and Fungai and Tiberius, tennis playing brothers who vacillate between yearning for belonging and bully tendencies. The group is, however, always in flux with cousins, classmates, boarders, and new neighbors coming and going. 
while their friends are initially drawn together by, happens, by the happenstance of neighborhood and a shared passion for soccer, they find themselves privy from the vantage point of their beloved dirt soccer field, Pashena, to a community forever transformed by the insatiable AIDS scourge and ominously dilapidating economy and the irreparable loss of communal innocence. Through it all, Pashena, Pashena serves as an agent in which the boys learn to negotiate their love of self, each other, and community, all while living in a world of which even the elders could ill make full sense of. So that is what the book is about. Um, so that was sort of an introduction. Then I'm going to go into talking about the, the passages, reading a couple of passages. And as we go through the night, I'm going to tell you, I think I've got like five or six reasons why you should definitely buy this book, right? Five or six reasons. Reason number one, all right? And I'm, I'm sort of, I've been trying to catch the vibe for the socio-political climate in, in, in Canberra in particular, in Australia in general. But, uh, you know, mom told me that this was fine to say here. Uh, so take it out with her. <laughs> uh, it's a thing. So, the publishing industry across the world, especially across the, the Western world, the publishing world is the domain of old middle class white men. That is who publishes things, right? Not, not, not the writers, of course, but that is who is at the top of the publishing game, the, pub, the publishing companies. So my publisher is uh, it's about my age, so 29, 30 year old, African-American woman. Um, yeah, so on, but by that logic alone, she is breaking convention on three levels. She is young, she's African-American, and she's a woman. So in so doing, in buying this book, you're supporting that sort of uh, shift uh, which, uh, which makes the publishing industry around the world more inclusive. So buy that book, if not even for the story, buy it for that reason. That's reason number one. And I'll get to reason number two and then a little bit later, right? So this part I want to read to you. So this is the first part I'm going to share from the book itself. Um, at this point, I'm sort of introducing the characters that make up the neighborhood, right? Um, and this is mid-90s in Zimbabwe, and the AIDS scourge has been starting to take its toll, okay? And we are seeing it predominantly through... Um, we are seeing it predominantly through the death of, of, of a lot of, of, of a lot of vibrant young people, yeah? Um, so this part, I'm introducing two characters, the brothers who have moved in from the rural areas. And their names are Fox, right, and Wellington. So where do I start? So I've, I've been describing them up to now, but here's, uh, here's the part I want to talk about. They spoke little about their rural life before they came to my ownership, only giving us glimpses through humorous tales from their, from their herding and hunting escapades when we would convene, convene under their guava tree. Their adult rumor mill had since made it known that their parents had died, carried away by the same creature that took, that took, that took their uncle and others. A year after they moved in with their aunt, she moved to another part of the city, leaving their house and their brothers under the custody of their 16-year-old sister, Sincere. She became their mother. Although we were young, we could not help but notice that a lot of people were dying. Tar's uncle, that's my next door neighbor, who had just moved in with them, just before their father died, also fell deathly ill. He lost so much weight 
that he had to cut off the back parts of his trousers and resaw the front part to half their size so they could fit in. His belt no longer fit in, and he had started using pieces of string to hold up his pants. He still insisted on going to the beer hall, though, and would painstakingly make his way up the street at a snail's pace in clear discomfort. Finally, it was so bad that Ta sought my aunt's help in keeping him home. One day, as he took off for, for the beer hall, she called out to him and said she had a package for him that she would pass to him over the fence. Once he was back in the yard, Ta locked the gate. As determined as he was to leave, he was too frail to climb over the gate or argue anymore. So that worked well. He died a week later. The people dying were not old either. It was always people that had just started working, or parents and uncles of our friends. It must have been something in the air. It was as if a hell sent death wind was sweeping across the land. It was sad and confusing. For days we would not see, and even if we did, would not know what to say to our friends who had had a death in their family. With time, however, they would come back to the rest of the group. For as long as we had a game of football they could join in, no words needed to be said. They were home. So, uh, this is uh, a story very familiar to uh, anybody who spent time in Zimbabwe, dare I say Southern Africa in the 90s, early 2000s, right? Because in Zimbabwe, at one point I remember one in every four, this is what the stats would say, one in every four people in the country was uh, HIV, uh, was infected with HIV or AIDS. One in every four. You can imagine that. That's incredible. And at that point, at its peak, I remember the average human life for, for, for the country was around 27. Now that I'm 30, at the time I thought, oh, you know, 27. I don't know, 27, 45 is the same thing, adults. Now that I'm, 20, I'm 30, I realize just how young 27 is, you know? And um, so on that note, I want to I wanna open it up for, for any comments, questions regarding this passage that I just read, sort of the, social, the writing process, the socioeconomic context from which it is born, yada, yada. Please feel free to ask, then I'll move on to my next passage. Any questions? Impeccable writing left all the questions answered, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm joking. Uh, so yes, that is the environment with which I'm writing. And hopefully I bring it full circle, because one thing that, that I set out not to do with this book is to write what some people in certain sectors have called uh, tragedy porn or poverty porn, which means there is such a demand to talk about the suffering of certain communities, right? There's such a demand. I know, and I've played into this myself a few times because I'm, I'm a poet as well. I know for a fact that if I'm at a show and it's not going well, if I bring out a poem about the suffering in Africa, I'm going to get uproar uproarious applause, 100% of the time. We can try it now, no, I'm joking. Uh, so we sort of play into this idea of romanticizing pain and fetishizing suffering, right? And this is what I said I ought to do with this book. So some of the stories, it would be disingenuous to talk about the community without talking about the suffering. However, I set out to make sure that the book was not about that suffering. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. So that was, I gave, yes. I, I have a question. Uh -huh. So uh, I'm very close to the book. So uh, I just don't want to be biased. But um, uh, the passage you just read is based on real life events. Yes. Uh, how difficult was it to, to to write about those things, knowing that uh, these are these are 
hear people you are writing about, you've given them pseudonyms, but yeah, these are things that actually happened. Oh, thank you very much. So I think that's a very important question, right? Because it does two things. On one hand, it was very easy to write it because I had seen it and lived it. And, and so on that one hand, it was very easy to write it. But when you write, or at least when I write, we have different processes. I initially write to stay true to the story. Um, publishing, on the other hand, or thinking about what, where the book was going to go, that's where it got a little bit harder because I do not want to... Um, to discuss people's affairs in this way. Um, so that part was hard, that part was hard. Uh, but I went back to the community. I hadn't been to Zimbabwe in seven or eight years at the point of this writing. Then I'd gone back, now, then I started going back every year uh, since 2014, 2015. And I, I spoke to the people, you know, I spoke to, the, to a lot of the people that I felt if the story was, was a little heavier gave them the segment, told them that I had written this thing or that thing. And I thought I was going to get some backlash, but for the most part it's been, thank you for telling our story, you know. And uh, so it was hard in thinking about where the story could go, but uh, once we started talking about it uh, and sharing with them, it was a very, you know, they, uh, the, the few that I got to talk to where, where they enjoy the story because like I said, there's a lot of funny parts, there's a lot of very empowering parts, and there's other parts as well. So the, the, the few that I spoke to were appreciative that their story was being told you know, in, in spaces that they'd ever, never seen names like theirs in print before, you know, or names of their community in print, so, for sure. All right, so reason number two why you should buy the book. Um, you could step out of here, the book costs 20, I haven't really done uh, too much um, fast food shopping while I've been here, but I gotta think for a good Hungry Jack's meal, might be around $20 too, but that is not good for you. So buy the book is the healthy option. Spend your $20 somewhere else. So, all right. Who here remembers their first brush with the law? Yeah, okay, thank you so much, right? Because I've done this in certain spaces with more people than this, and nobody puts up their hand. I'm like, you guys are so much better than me. Uh, so your first brush with the law, right? So this is mine. I'm gonna tell you about my first brush with the law. So what happened was, me and my best friend at the same, same time, uh, Innocent was his name, which the irony didn't hit me at all when I was writing the book until uh, last week when I was doing this and I realized that my first brush with the law was with Innocent. Um, which it might have been because I'm sure I was the overwhelming influence in that situation. So what happened was this, we were, we had joined this library, we were like nerds, right, in fourth grade and the only thing we, we liked to do, well not the only thing, because we also like to play soccer, but we like to read and read the law. So we joined this library which was in our neighborhood, and it was a Catholic library. There were two libraries, there was a city council library and a Catholic library. Now the Catholic library, you know, was, was, was just our preferred choice. And we, but we could only take two books at a time, yeah? And uh, for, you know, I think you could have the books for like, but we were reading at such a pace that that just didn't suffice anymore. So we needed to find a way in which we could get more than two books at a time, right? So this is this is how that story goes. We devised the plan. 
Why have we signed up as new members under different names? We do not have any identification. The whole thing was on a sort of faith, on, on, a, on a system. We do not have any identification. Registering for a library card only costs 50 cents and the librarians do faith that no ten-year-old bookworm would create a fraudulent account at the Catholic library, no less. We figured out that the librarians change shifts at three o'clock. We would create our second account with the later librarian, seeing as she was not too, seeing as she was not too familiar with us. We could go in soon after school and immediately check out a pair of books each. We would then hang around the library doing homework and reading comics until the three o'clock lady came in and we would check out our other two books under, the, under our criminal identities. Our good run came to an end in due time though. One Wednesday afternoon, we pulled off the first heist with a clockwork precision that we had established. After three, we went back to the checkout counter and Innocent went first. He checked out his two books out, he checked his two books out and made for the door like any good fugitive ship. It was my turn. Good afternoon, madam. Hey, young man. What do you have there? I'd like to borrow this Hardy Boys book and Aladdin. Excellent choices. What's your name? I am Tapua Dube. Tapua Dube is not a name. It's a messy cat thing. <laughs> By now, this particular lie was second nature to me that I did not bat an eyelid when telling her. The lady looked at me incredulously. I wasn't looking at her, but I could sense something was wrong because of how long she seemed to be taken. I would normally tell her my name and she would get the file without hesitation. I started to shiver. I have never been a good liar and my temperament was not built for an inquisition. Nervously, I raised my head to meet her gaze, and as soon as I looked at her, I realized where our infallible plan had gone wrong. This was not the usual afternoon librarian. They had, just, they had just hired a new one, and she was none other than my second cousin and close family friend, Priscilla. I was a good friend to her younger brother, Gandanga, but she had been away in college for a while and had only recently returned to town, and I failed to recognize her behind the counter. Innocent and I got banned from the Catholic Library. Priscilla was kind enough not to tell Gogo, who's my grandma and the matriarch of both our families, of my misdeeds. And my darling old and the darling old lady never figured out why I insisted on switching from the Catholic Library to the City Council one. That was my first and for a long time last brush with the law. That was innocent. That was innocent and me. So, yeah, a little uh, anecdote there, sort of, yeah, a way to introduce the characters and sort of see how we develop. That's a little bit early on in the first third of the book, and it's, uh, if I may say so myself, it's fascinating to see how these relationships and these characters develop throughout the story. So, uh, any questions about my library shenanigans? No? All right, good. By all means, let me reiterate that there's a complimentary cupcakes in the bag. Um, uh, reason number three why you should buy the book. So, There is a chance, and after this you can rate that chance as high or small, as, you think, as big or small as you may think. There's a chance that I'm about to become a big time writer, all right? Like big, like Oprah big, and, well not actually Oprah big, but to be on Oprah big. Uh, and best, New York's bestseller uh, big, right? And you will look back at the time when this Imagine if J.K. Rowling had come to Smith's and you were here and you left after she got famous and you were telling everybody that I remember I saw her once, she was at Smith, they'll be like, get out of here. 
I was like, well, you have nothing to show for it because you never bought the book that would have been signed by her. But if you get it signed by me today, in 10 years' time, you can tell everybody, kids, grandkids, friends, that I remember when this guy was at Smith's and I got a book to prove it. So make sure you, uh, you buy this book. Because when somebody gets famous, you're never going to have another... There's no more J.K. Rowling and Smiths, you know? And this is with, with, I mean, it's just the way life goes. So, cash me while you still can. Uh, that's reason number three <laughs> to buy the book. Um, let me read perhaps one more passage. Oh, reason number four. Let me give you reason number four while I'm at it. Reason number four. I'm here in town visiting my mom uh, over here. So if you buy the book, I can be a good son and buy a cup of coffee once or twice. So support that movement. Um, let, me, let me read one more passage. That sort of brings uh, full circle that story with the... With the, with the neighbors I was talking about whose 16-year-old sister had started to raise them after their parents and had died of, 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 of HIV, of the creature, so to speak, as we called it. And this is on page... Uh, And so, see, I know this is not big uh, soccer country. Any soccer fans in the house? A couple? Uh, any? All right, let me see how deep we go with this. Anybody remember the 98 World Cup? No? Okay. So. This is typical, this reminds me, I feel at home, I feel like I'm in the U.S. right now because nobody cares about soccer. Uh, so, but as children, right, as, even as adults, but especially as children, you will always associate something that happens more on a personal level with something that is happening in the, in the sort of, in the larger society at the time, right? So you will know that, yeah, I remember, for example, I remember when I visited, visited Canberra, because that is the time the Barnaby Joyce and Vicky interview aired. I remember, I remember that, you know, so I can put those two things together, because something else happened while something was happening on a personal level. I remember when I, you know, this sort of things. So this is, since the book focuses, I mean, not focuses, but centers around our soccer field and our love for soccer and the things we were seeing. Um, the 98 World Cup was happening, right? But it was also a very moving moment for our community. And so I'm going to talk about that, right? I have gone on to see a few more World Cups since 1998, some of which were all things considered grander and more intense. None, however, have stuck out in my memory like this one has. It was held in France, and I remember my fascination with the radio profiles of the country and its culture. I remember all five African countries starting the tournament with flair, only to be eliminated unceremoniously as the, as the tournament progressed, a pattern which I have since learned to be recurrent at every World Cup thus far. Nigeria went as far as the last 16, but was beaten convincingly by Denmark. I also remember at 11, learning about countries that I had never before heard of. Croatia, Chile, Saudi Arabia, and others. I remember Croatia doing exceptionally well and only losing to France in the semifinals. Ronaldo, Zidane, Clivert, Olise, Lodro, what odd names, I thought at first, Yet I soon felt like I knew this man personally. I remember the morning we found out that Sincere had died. As a condition that worsened in a rural home, they decided it was best to send her back to Mutada for medical attention. Upon her return, 
Gogo, who's again my grandma, and the other elderly women took turns in going over to their house with fruits and different brewed drinks. Soon, she was not walking at all, and I heard she had to wear diapers. None of us, with the obvious exception of her brothers, were allowed to see her through it all. We were, however, invited to their house for what I now realize was one last farewell. She lay there, her sunken eyes and cracked lips in an unrecognizable form of the stern, yet beautiful uh, big sister we had be grown begrudgingly fond of, and under a two-in-one blanket that my ta had given her as a gift from South Africa. The next morning, the morning of July 12, 1998, I remember it so because it was the morning of the World Cup final between Brazil and France. Word has it she died giving birth in their house. She held her baby in her arms and they shared it here, his first and her last, before she convulsed one last time and stopped breathing. The baby died within the hour. Word has it that Brazilian superstar Ronaldo was under the weather going into the game and had been warned by doctors not to play. He insisted and soon found himself on the floor and unable to continue. France won that game to Israel. That was July 12, 1998. So we saw uh, the boys move in with their big sister uh, at the beginning of the story, she was 16 at the time and almost immediately became their mom. And this scene I described takes place maybe three or four years later. So she wouldn't have been much more than 20. And now she is dying, falling victim to the same creature that had taken her parents. And this is a, uh, this is a, uh, a story, you know, that a lot of people who, who lived in our community at the time can relate to. You were always one or two people removed from, from something like that that was happening, especially with the younger adults. And part of the reason why I write these stories in the book, other than the fact that they are part of our of our growing up and our loss of innocence and these things is because I want to put human faces on these one in every four figures or in these, you know, from further away it may just look like, ah, these AIDS ravaged places. But these are people, uh, beautiful people, respected people, people with goals and dreams and unfortunate circumstances that, you know, that's just how it played out on their end, so um, let me open it up to any questions regarding that passage or regarding the book as a whole or regarding other things, the process, the, you know, uh, anything, anything you want to ask about the book or me or whatever, these things I talk about. Sir. Thank you for everything. Man, that is such a good question. So what sort of comfort and reparations and, and these things they find from writing this? One, I think on a very almost selfish level, I hadn't been back yet. Like I left Zimbabwe in 2006, I hadn't been back for, you know, it was 2013, 14 when I was writing this. So first, I just really missed home and I got to relive home through writing this story. So that's one. Secondly, with folks like Sincere that I'm talking about and the several other people who have since passed on, I got to experience them again, right? I got to, for the whole time that I was writing this story, I was with them again. And there was something that even if I know my imagination is filling in the gaps because I was a child at the time. But I had seen these folks and um, she caught the disease and she's sick and she's dying. Oh, this person is so mean, yada, yada. 
and now I'm in my mid-twenties, maybe the same age they were, maybe a little bit older, and I'm telling this story, and I feel I almost understand them now because this is what you went through. So I feel like I lived with them in that part of as much as you can. So I really enjoyed that. The other thing that I think has been important was when I shared the story, even bits and pieces of it, uh, the guy I wrote, read about earlier, Innocent, he's one of the people who actually edited the book, the first round anyway. But he was really checking for, you know, for continuity errors, if that really happened or if that was too wild, you know. So him and a few other people, Ty, I keep talking about how they've seen the story. And just hearing them, you know, I, this is not my story, this is not my book anymore. This is, I told them, this is, this is your book, I'm just telling it. You know, this is your story, I'm just telling it. And just seeing how much they've appreciated that, right? Uh, that, to me, has been the greatest, um, I don't know, maybe I'm going to make a million dollars off of this and that would top that as the greatest thing to come out of this book, but right now, that really is the greatest thing that I've gotten from the book, indeed. Any other questions? Man, I enjoy this, keep it coming. So I've got a quick question. Yes. Soccer plays a, obviously a big theme through the book. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like soccer was a place to um, disappear into or have some reprieve from mm -hmm. everything that was going on. Mm -hmm. And it still seems today to be the case for many young people in areas of conflict or a difficulty that soccer can provide that mm -hmm. escape. Is that, is that so in your novel? Absolutely. I, I, yeah, I, you, you nailed it. Um, and there are, you know, that is, a major one, and the, there's a there's a reason for that, right? Um, part of the reason why it is soccer and not anything else. There's two reasons that I venture, and if I'm missing something, you know, some of you other guys can can plug in the gaps. I see a few folks from Zimbabwe as well, and you know, my brother from Zambia over here. Uh, you know, you can plug in the gaps as well. But in places where of not much means, yeah? Two things that you want. One, soccer is very, is very cheap, right? It's very cheap to play. You just need a flat surface and some semblance of a ball. It doesn't even have to bounce, right? You know, we usually make, the ones we talk about in here, we make them with, with plastic bags and, and, and rags and things. It doesn't have to bounce. If you can put a little bounce to it, the better. But it doesn't even, you don't have to buy it, you can just, make it out of refuse, then you can put stones uh, as goals and just do that, right? So one is very cheap, right? In ways that you couldn't possibly get a game of tennis going like that, or, you know, I know India has done some good stuff with cricket uh, in some of their more lower income communities, but it's, it's just cheap, which is why I think it finds resonance. Then the second thing, which it probably has in common with games like, uh, I know the US basketball is that sport, uh, you know, like I said, in India it's cricket, it's very communal, right? So soccer, 11 people a team, right? But anything from two people a team to, I played 15 people a team games, you know? So it's very communal. So the combination of it being very cheap and you don't have to do too much for it, you just find a piece of land, the street even, and you can have everybody playing in it. So that's why it provides this, that's why it is this main escape. But as the story unfolds, you find people breaking into uh, basketball, you sort of introduce at the end of the, of the book, and that's where some folks start to find solace. Uh, ping pong, table tennis is another thing that people get into. Uh, I noticed recently when I go back, there's a move, a huge movement towards traditional dancing. So it's all these sort of spaces, right? But I think soccer continues to have, at least among the, the, the young, the boys, and young men, it continues to have that monopoly, I think, historically, and the fact that you can just have a lot of people playing at a time. But it definitely is a place of escape, and they come a dime a dozen in these places, yeah. Indeed. All right, before we get back to the questions, uh, 
um, sharing this moment, coffee. So we did four. Uh, two final, okay, a couple more reasons that I want to, <laughs> why you really should buy this book. This is, I wrote this book in the US mainly, did some revision in South Africa, but I've done readings in the US, which is essentially home for me now. So this is technically my first international sharing of the book, and I'm sharing it with you, so buy it. Uh, <laughs> um, then also, reason number five, it is a well-written book, dang it. It is so good. Uh, <laughs> Well, no, I'm not saying that, but, you know, but I wrote it, then it went into publication. Any, any writers in the house? A few, a few writers. Any, any artists in the house of any sort? Any other artists? All right. So, you know, sometimes you work on something and you step away from it, even if you write an exam or something, and you turn it in, then you go home and you're like, ah. I don't know if that was right. I, I think I might have messed that up. Or, man, did I? I, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. <coughs> then you might see it, and most of the time it's good, right? So that's what happened, but imagine that one night is like a year when the book is in publication. I'm like, I bet I didn't account for this. I bet I spelled this word wrong. I always struggle with spelling this word, and the editors don't catch it, the book is gonna be published, and this word is gonna be wrong, and I'm gonna look stupid. Ah, oh, did I talk about this guy? Or did I just introduce this character and leave him halfway? Then I got it after when it came out. I was like, no, it checks out. It's so that's reason number five. But I say all that in sort of uh, being playful and, and you know just really trying to get you to uh, check it out. Uh, but the most important reason, the f by far the most important reason, is this: we need to tell our own stories. We need to tell our own stories. Now, we are a pretty diverse crowd today, so if you come from a culture or a community or a demographic whose stories have always been told by the people from that demographic, fine, you may not understand how significant this is. But for for more than a century, the African story has been told either by non-Africans or if often by, by Africans but through that gaze which was created by non-Africans, right? Which is, goes back to the point I was making earlier about, honestly, if the story is not about starvation and AIDS and, and being a child soldier and and these things, the world doesn't want to hear it. That's the African story that people like, right? And I mean, you cannot tell our stories, I cannot tell the story genuinely without including some of those things if that's what was happening. So that's why I talk about HIV AIDS, talk about the dilapidating economy, but also, how about the time when me and my friend tried to sneak into the library and get four books instead of two? That is, you want to talk about an African story? That too is an African story that is worth of telling. I want to talk about the one time that these bullies walked up on us and one of my friends punched him in the face and we broke out and it was so much fun, we remembered it forever because that too is an African story. If it works for an Australian childhood, for an American childhood, for a British, for a French childhood, it works perfectly. That is our story. That is childhood across the board, right? A few, I remember my grandma, I talk about this as well, my grandma, she used, she was a nurse and she would come with this pristine white uniform and we'll be playing on this dirt field and every time she'll be walking down from the bus, we run over to her and we hug her and now I'm just like, ah, oh, she wouldn't say much but that must have been awful for her because she had to bleach it and now she's, she, this white uniform just turned brown. That is the story. Let, hear about these kids who are in love with their grandmother as well, right? It's good to hear a story 
where these African kids are not hiding in bushes from, from warlords. It's good to hear a story about where we're not waking up every morning wondering when our next meal is coming from because more often than not, that is what the African story is. And this is what I set out to do with this book in a major way. Um, so if anything, support this wave. We call it Afropolitan a writing, support this wave of writing and uh, hear a different African story. So that's the most important reason that I think you should buy the book if you can. Um, other than that, let me say this. My name is Shingima Vima. You can see it on the board. Uh, if you're interested in some of my writings and things like that, please find me on social media. My website is uh, shingimavima.com, just that name. You can write it down, take a picture of it. Follow me on Facebook, uh, uh, my page on Facebook, whatever all these pages. And you know, if you buy the book, uh, perfect. If not, and you're interested in reading, you know, kind of staying in touch or seeing some of my work, please follow me on those sites. And yeah, bo, with that, what are we, how are we doing for time? Perfect. Perfect. Woo! <laughs> all right. Um, and I'll be over here uh, to chat and to, to sign books. And uh, the cupcakes are over there as well. So you have a reason to come over there. All right. Uh, thank you all very much for your audience. I really appreciate it.